Hitting record. Good morning, all you lovely people out there trying to make the world a better place. Welcome to the Dead Man Walking Podcast. I am your host, Repeatedly Dead Fred, author of the soon-to-be-released medical trauma memoir, The Summer I Died 20 Times, which is what happened to me and why I'm Repeatedly Dead Fred. So there's the quick story. Buy the book when it comes out. Today, I am thrilled to have not only an intermittent faster, but the queen of getting you off sugar, Netta Gorman, who is in Quebec via England. So she has both accents and she can speak to you in both languages. <laughs> Netta, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very welcome. So we first met through Jen Stevens and you were recently on uh, Jen Stevens' Intermittent Fasting Stories podcast. Yes. So this is a little step down for you. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. <laughs> and uh, so I'm fascinated by your story. I knew you a little bit through interacting in in her community circle, but um, very few of the intermittent fasters that I've met have made the dramatic switch in their diets that that you have or had has happened to you, however it worked. So. Right. Would you like to tell the listeners, the audience, the viewers, whoever there are out there uh, a little bit, firstly, how you came to intermittent fasting and then how you came to realizing sugar was like just stomping you down? Yeah, actually, it happened the other way around okay. um, because I'd never heard of intermittent fasting, didn't know the term, I didn't know the concept. And quite frankly, you know, when you don't know about anything, you don't look for it necessarily because how can you but mm -hmm. um, my story starts in um, two, 2015 although it did start about 15 years before that because I, I was suffering from really bad slow digestion from my late 20s into my mid 40s and that was really what pushed me to to get some to try something else than what I'd always been told which is eat more fiber eat more fiber um, because I was like going to the bathroom like once or twice a week and it was mm -hmm. not fun. Um, but the problem was that everything I was being told to do was making things worse. And I was desperate. I was desperate to find some sort of solution. I, my sort of lifelong dream was just to go to the toilet every day. And, <laughs> and, and It sounds so funny, but it's not funny. It was it was funny, not funny at all. I was really suffering. It's toxic for your body, you know, not to mm -hmm. be able to eliminate every day. So um, anyway, so I came across a nutritional therapist, actually, who worked with my brother at the time, and she was based in the States. And she, uh, he put me in touch with, with her. And she, one of the things she suggested was for me for two weeks only, and she, really two weeks only, to cut sugar, flour, or refined grains, and sweeteners. And I was like, no, what are you crazy? Like, who would <laughs> do such a thing? That mm -hmm. I just want to look after my digestion. I don't want to feel even worse by getting rid of all the foods I love, you know? Mm -hmm. So because of my personality, slightly rebellious, <laughs> mm -hmm. I went, I said, no, no, no way. No way am I giving up chocolate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the upshot was that I didn't change anything. And when you don't change, nothing changes. And I came mm -hmm. to that conclusion pretty fast in the space of a few weeks. And I thought, look, you know, nothing's changing. Nothing's getting any better. I'm in the same spot I was before I said no <laughs> to this mm -hmm. crazy experiment. I might as well give it a go. And everything hinges on that approach, I think, of let's give it a go. Mm -hmm. And I credit myself, I must say, with having at least that tiny bit of open mindedness and adventurous spirit to say, all right, you know, I'm backed up against the wall. I'll give it a go. And I did. So you're not giving it a go or giving it a go allowed you to give it a go. Right. <laughs> well so, said. <laughs> so, so how quickly did you start noticing um i guess maybe i'll take a step back like how much did you cut out how quickly and then how quickly did you notice it started having a positive effect on your body 
maybe yeah. talk about besides the bowel movement some of the other things that were going on with your body yes yes let's concentrate on other things apart from my bowel movements please <laughs> um it happened i cut out pretty much all sweet tasting foods and starchy foods with the exception of some fruit straight away when i decide mm -hmm. to do something i'm all in and i thought i might as well do this properly she'd sort of given me a list of of foods basically it was a list of real foods all i was cutting mm -hmm. out was food products was processed products not actual real foods as i realized later but i said if i'm going to do this i'll do it properly and mm -hmm. I did. So all forms of sugar, all forms of refined grains, including flour and, and even whole grains or so-called whole and uh, sweeteners. And basically, I noticed a difference within a week, within a week. Within one week? Yes. That's amazing. Yes, absolutely. And not only was it amazing for me to notice within a week, it carried on for the second week. And I, and then the nutritional therapist said, well, you can start reintroducing a few of the things that you cut out. And I went, no, what are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> carry on. I'm feeling so much more energetic. And my, my spare tire was melting away, you know, the few extra pounds I had. And I was just feeling less creaky when I got up in the morning. My joints were more supple supple and I wasn't getting hungry as often I wasn't mm -hmm. getting cravings as much I thought I'm, I want more of this and I carried mm -hmm. on for another week and another week and I think basically it's been over seven years so your sugar addiction turned into a non-sugar addiction very quickly it's well, quite the reversal yes I mean my body experienced the changes much faster than my brain did so mm -hmm. strictly speaking, now that I know more about sugar addiction and the whole sort of concept of addiction, strict, strictly speaking, I wasn't addicted to sugar, not on mm -hmm. the sort of official definition of what sugar addiction is, because it's on a sliding scale. And I was able to do this, I wouldn't say easily, but relatively easily. Mm -hmm. um, but realize people are going to hate you now. Yes, I realize that, but they'll love me in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> when we when I tell them how they can do this. So, but the thing is that there are actually way more people on the lower end, as it were, of the of the sugar addiction or food addiction sliding scale than there are on the higher end. But we tend to identify ourselves as more addicted than we actually are most of us mm -hmm. is what i've found since, since you know since i've been in this world of sugar and sugar addiction but um just coming back to the changes for me they happened pretty fast because i think i was quite um i i suppose you could say quite strict or quite sort of extreme in what i stopped eating mm -hmm. and because of my personality, and I go into this in my podcast about, you know, I, I borrow Gretchen Rubin's, are you a moderator or an abstainer? Because I'm more of an abstainer naturally in my natural personality. Mm -hmm. It didn't fit me, as it turned out, it didn't fit me just to reduce forms of sugar gradually, because mm -hmm. I was the sort of person that couldn't just eat a bite or a, one cookie and then sort of carry on with my life. I, I kept eating more, but again, that doesn't mean that I was an addict, strictly speaking. Yeah, I find I'm more of an intermittent binger like that. You know, it's hard to it's hard to stop. Um, right, right. Um, but at the same time, I didn't have binging behavior as I since learned what that actually is, and that mm -hmm. wasn't my lived experience. Yeah, and I've been through the. Uh, I don't know if you know the book, The Joy of Half a Cookie about oh, mindful yeah. eating and ah, yeah. uh so i've i've been through that program and it helps a lot but it's you know you have to be mindful you really really have to be mindful right right and i have i'm lucky in the sense that i'm a teacher at college level here in quebec and i teach my students to be mindful because when you're learning a new language i teach english as a second language because i live in a french speaking environment and it's i often sort of um, compare learning 
a new language with learning a new way of eating, including intermittent fasting, because it does require mindfulness of you to learn mm -hmm. this new vocabulary, as it were, to learn new sentence structure. But, you know, you, you see the analogy I make with just to learn new habits, to learn a new way of relating to your food, to learn a new way of relating to yourself and to mm -hmm. life in general. Yeah, I know if I was back in the classroom, I was a former former business professor before I got sick. Um, and I used to teach all the students, you know, go to Toastmasters and learn how to t how to communicate and how to be a professional, how to do presentations. But if I was going back now, I would certainly harp on mindfulness and intermittent fasting and stay off the sugars. And that would give you such a competitive edge over any of your classmates going into the business world that, you know, it's almost unfair, you know, yes. you'd yes. be like, you yeah, know. I think mindfulness is, um, first of all, underappreciated. And a lot of people, young, the young students I teach are 17 to 19 year olds, but adults are also don't want to be mindful because it requires effort. And very few of us have any energy left at the end of the day for more effort, unless, of course, we don't eat sugar, in which case we have boundless energy. Mm hmm. So you've you've given up most of the sugars, but you're good with most of the natural sugars, I think. Like well, you eat fruit. What and... you mean by natural sugars? Can you specify what you mean by natural sugars? Well, you'll eat a uh, an apple or a banana or something, you know, that I think is natural, even though they're not as natural as they were fifty years ago, because right. you know they're all GMO'd. Right. But my taste buds over these last seven years have changed so much that actually sweet tastes are now um, not they don't taste good to me. Mm -hmm. I don't actually enjoy sweet tastes anymore. And believe me, I was the world's number one sweet tooth. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't eat a banana. It's just way too sweet. It overwhelms me. I have no pleasure eating a banana. I can just about manage half a green apple before I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, too much, too much sweetness. And that's a green apple. Mm -hmm. Grapes have become very difficult for me to to eat. Uh, if I buy a bunch of grapes, most likely two thirds of them will die in the fridge. And uh, but bananas um, and Honeycrisp apples seem to be OK for me. But I um, imagine eventually I'll find out like you that uh, that they won't be so good. You, awesome. You've also delved into the fermenteds. So yes. do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, sure. And then we'll get back to intermittent fasting because I haven't um, mentioned that too much yet. But yes, well, because I had all these digestive problems, the one other thing that the nutritional therapist mentioned to me was, let's see if you can get more fermented foods and drinks into your diet. And I didn't really know much about them, although my brother was into making sauerkraut at home, lacto mm -hmm. fermented sauerkraut. But I just, you know, it's my brother. I just thought he was weird like you do, you know, <laughs> <laughs> until I myself sort of got in, got interested into it because, because of my own suffering, you, you sort of, you don't really, mm -hmm. it do, it's not on your radar until it actually impacts you. Mm -hmm. So I started getting into making my own yogurt, my own milk kefir, my own kombucha, my fermented vegetables like sauerkraut and kimchi, and I just, I found it fascinating. And it's so much easier than people think. Plus, mm -hmm. it's so much cheaper than in, mm -hmm. in the stores. And I have to say, I'm a bit frugal, to put it politely. Mm -hmm. So it, it was wonderful for me because I love the taste. It's a mm -hmm. whole new world of different foods. Plus, they're probiotic and good for your gut health. Mm -hmm. And we know now that gut health rules the world. Those little buggers. <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah. Yes, so what's did. the difference between kefir and yogurt? I thought they were the same thing. No, they're not the same thing. They each contain different strains of good bacteria, of probiotics. Mm -hmm. um, kefir, milk kefir has been shown to be around 10 times more probiotic than yogurt. And I'm comparing homemade, not store-bought, because you mm -hmm. never know really with store-bought 
whether the, whether it's actually got live cultures or whether it says it's got live cultures, but they're still live, or whether the whole yogurt product has been either pasteurized after fermentation, which kills all the good bacteria, or added, you know, having added sugar in it, which just cancels out the good bacteria anyway. Okay, so I showed you this before we started recording. So this yes. is not a brand endorsement. So I have a friend who, who got me on this and I have to admit, it makes me feel a little bit better. My digestion runs a little smoothly. So we're but talking about in, kombucha here. Yeah. So um, in general though, a store-bought versus made at home. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you're smirking for the people who aren't watching on, <laughs> on video. I'm so, waiting for your question. Well, I, I think the question is, is there any value to these that you buy in the store? For who? For the companies who make them? Yes, tons of value. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For the consumer, not so much. Mm -hmm. So what you showed us, am I allowed to say the brand? Sure. Will we, get, we won't get sued, we're in Canada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's GTs. Um, it's raw kombucha, which means it hasn't been pasteurized after fermentation so that's all good gts mm -hmm. if you're going to buy kombucha you know um, gts is not a bad brand at all that's the brand i bought i bought two bottles of gts before i ever started making my own um, and i actually started off my whole home kombucha with a bottle of gt so mm -hmm. i'm forever grateful to them but um, of course all kombucha companies that sell commercially need to respond to the general public's love for sweet tastes mm -hmm. so whatever type of kombucha you're likely to buy i'm sure there's exceptions but in general whatever type of kombucha brand you're likely to buy probably has a sweet taste even the keto ones that add stevia or some other sweetener it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what kind of sweetener it is um if it tastes sweet, it'll probably trigger some sort of craving for most people. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and as I said before, I personally don't like sweet tastes anymore. And I realize I'm one of a kind on all kinds of levels, but on this particular level. Um, so my own kombucha that I brew for, or I brew, that just means I let it ferment. I just ignore it for about a month to do its thing it tastes like vinegar for most people and it's all yummy yeah. for me well i'm a gingy as you can tell or maybe not yes, so i went with the ginger version of of this and yeah. uh, it is not sweet at all so mm. it may have some sweetness in there that i just can't tell but um, yeah well the, the freaky I, thing about kombucha is that it's made with sugar but if it ferments all the sugars eaten up by the good bacteria mm -hmm. So if there's any kind of sweet taste, it means it was added after fermentation. Okay. So on your website, and if you want to plug your website and your podcast, please, um, do you have any videos or instruction on how people can make their own fermented foods? Well, on my website, I'll plug it here, aftersugarclub.com. Um, I have videos about why fermented foods is so important are so important and why gut health is so important and why sugar screws up your gut health and that is way more important i think for people to know than the how to videos there are millions of them on youtube whatever not mine but there's millions mm -hmm. of them i do actually teach how i make them inside of my membership inside of my program but mm -hmm. I haven't put it out there publicly because quite honestly, there's so many out there and mm -hmm. I don't concentrate on the how to or the recipes as much as on the why is it important to, to consume and preferably, you know, make your own gut healthy foods and drinks. Mm -hmm. So we're getting uh, a little short on time. So I want to transition back to intermittent fasting. Yes. So if, the sugar reduction had gone so well for you. Why would you take the next step to intermittent fasting? Or how did you find out about it? 
Yeah, no, I, as I said, it didn't, I didn't find out about it. It found me mm -hmm. because when I reduced sugar, not just when I reduced sugar and sweet foods and starchy foods, but when I continued not to eat them, and that's an important distinction, what happened naturally is appetite correction, which I'm sure you've heard about uh -huh. and read about with Bert Herring, which I also didn't know about this concept at all. My body knew without mm -hmm. my intellect knowing, but appetite correction came naturally. I was getting hungry less often. Um, I was certainly not needing to snack and, and I was still snacking because I thought you had to. to isn't some, that freaky? Isn't that freaky, right? For the little I knew about um, human biology, um, I thought that my metabolism would break like a twig mm -hmm. if I didn't mm -hmm. snack every three hours. That's complete rubbish. But now I know. Um, but anyway, so I gradually needed to snack less and less. Then I stopped snacking. Then I realized, oh, wow. I'm not hungry at lunchtime or whatever random meal time came along. And in the end, I just naturally started eating when I was hungry, which was less and less often. Now it's once or twice a day. And it's more of a social occasion for me to eat than and it's never this kind of um, intense need for or hunger to eat, you know? I mm -hmm. look forward to eating. I enjoy my food immensely, but I'm not on my knees dying to eat. Funnily enough, like I used to be five or six times a day when I was still consuming sugar and starchy foods. Mm -hmm. So how did you find Jen? Um, I, I got her books. I read her books. I joined mm -hmm. her group. And we, you know, she's a teacher. I'm a teacher. We sort of mm -hmm. got into We're all teachers. We're all teachers at heart. Um, anyway, so we hit it off and we had started chatting. And I don't know, she I invited her on my podcast. She invited me on her podcast. And it's all a big love fest, really. Yeah, I mean, she's so gracious. For those of you who don't know Jin, um, you know, she's got a New York Times bestseller, um, Fast Feast Repeat, an Amazon bestseller, Delay Don't Deny, uh, runs one of the most famous uh popular intermittent fasting podcasts around the intermittent fasting stories and she's just so generous and gracious with her time i mean for me you know she's been helping me get my book to production and giving me advice and uh you know her podcast was the first podcast i was ever on and uh look at me now i'm a superstar so <laughs> <laughs> um you know just you know Give Netta a listen, give Jen a listen, um, and, and you'll get really, really good information. Thank you. Yes, my podcast is called Life After Sugar. And people imagine, I just have to say this, but people imagine that life after sugar is sort of joyless and boring and just like denying yourself all the fun in life and all the good food in life and then they meet me and they look at me do I look sad to you mm -hmm. and they're like they, there's this cognitive dissonance they're like freaking out that wait a minute this woman doesn't eat any of what we consider to be fun foods right and I have mm -hmm. to say, yeah, I carry my fun along with me, inside of me. I, I don't give away my power to sugar to decide how much fun I have in life. Mm -hmm. But they see me and they're like, oh, what's going on? She doesn't eat everything that's considered fun. And at the same time, she looks happier than I am. Yeah, I love that phrase. I don't give away my power to sugar. Uh, that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, so. yeah. It's very and... empowering to be sugar free. Mm -hmm. So um what would be the the first thing you would suggest to people do you suggest they go all in or do you i guess it depends on the personality exactly that's what i suggest you hit the nail on the head i suggest you have a little bit of introspection first to de to determine what type of person are you naturally right? In your life in general, are you the sort of step-by-step, -step, 
you know, take it easy, go gradually in all kinds of things, all decisions you make in your life? Or are you, I'll throw myself into it 100%. That's more my sort of personality. But you don't have to be like me. In fact, I tell people, please don't be like me. Be mm -hmm. like you. It's the only thing that's sustainable is to respect your natural personality, whatever you do, including cutting sugar. Mm -hmm. So what has been your experience that people find easiest to cut initially? Easiest to cut usually is liquid sugars. So drinks okay. that are sweet. Um, also sort of obvious sources of added sugars, like all the desserts and the donuts and the... The mm -hmm. most difficult tend to be uh, the starchier types of foods. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so bread, crackers, pasta. Yeah, I don't eat any of I don't eat any of those. And yet my life is perfectly joyful. Um, mm -hmm. And also um, what seems to be quite problematic for people is social occasions and social pressure to consume different mm -hmm. types of food. So that I help people with that a lot as well. Yeah, I find that even after almost four years of of intermittent fasting, if I go to friends for meals, uh, a lot of them have adjusted and they're okay with me not eating and just, you know, sipping on a, a mineral water or something. But some of them, they just get, how can you not be eating? Like, yeah. this, this is, you know, like, yes. Uh, well, look at me versus what I was five years ago. I, I think the answer is obvious. Right. So. If they followed your life story, you know, and your situation, your health over a period of time, then they know. Obviously, people mm -hmm. weren't following me into the bathroom to see how often <laughs> I was eliminating. So they don't actually know how much better mm -hmm. my intestines feel, but they can see how much mm -hmm. better I am. Yeah. What are your non-scale victories? Just well, as I said, get, you know, pooing every day. <laughs> <laughs> If you really want to know. Um, I'm going to change the name of this to the poo cast. <laughs> well, you know, there's no shame in it. We all do it. Um, mm. And so that was a non-scale victory. In fact, they're pretty much all non-scale victories. Um, having more energy, uh, a more stable mood. You know, the ups and downs of life still happen. I often say real life happens even when you don't eat sugar. So there's ups and downs. Um, apparently there was some kind of pandemic going on and I still didn't eat sugar because mm -hmm. that's life out there um, and that so my I suppose my non-scale victory on that scale is I feel good whatever's going on out there and that mm -hmm. doesn't mean I'm a robot without human emotions but it means that fundamentally what I do how I eat and how I live makes me feel good so I just carry on and I didn't have a huge amount of weight to lose, but whatever I did have to lose, I lost it pretty fast and effortlessly. Mm -hmm. And your skin looks fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I feel great. I'm um, I'm soon to be 53 years old and I don't feel it at all. Good for you. And hopefully that continues. Thank so, you. As Jit says, we're almost out of time. So instead of doing her, what would you tell people? I'm going to ask you to spin the uh, Dead Man Walking podcast wheel of questions. And I'd like to ask you to pick a number from 1 to 36. I apologize. I usually tell people before we start recording that I'm going to do this. And these are just random questions. And if you don't like the question, you can pick another number and we'll see if something fits you. Okay? All right. 14. 14. Okay. Have you ever experienced a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake? And I suspect in the middle of Quebec, you do not. Ah, uh, but I haven't lived here all my life. And when we were in Mexico um, on sabbatical, I experienced, we experienced an earthquake. And did yeah. that make you want to eat sugar again? Ah, uh, that was before all that stuff. So wow. I don't remember. It was during the night. So it was like, yeah, we weren't eating during the night anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I think I'm going to change that question up. It doesn't really lead to any good follow-up questions. But <laughs> I'm glad you survived, and I'm yeah. very glad you were here with us. You're so welcome. please uh, 
tell the audience again the name of your podcast. And I think you're up to like close to 100 episodes now, aren't you? Close to 100 episodes, just past 200,000 downloads. So it's wow. quite popular. Um, it's called Life After Sugar. It's on all major podcast players. My website is aftersugarclub.com. You can find the podcast there. You can find all kinds of free resources there. You can find my membership there, my program, a 12-week program. I'm also on Facebook, Life After Sugar, Instagram at My Life After Sugar, YouTube, Life After Sugar, all over the place. I'm sensing a sugar theme. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, and you are Netta Gorman. Thank you, Netta, for being on the show. I very much appreciate it. Thank you to the audience for tuning in to this episode of the Dead Man Walking podcast. And please share, smash that like button, subscribe, tell people about Netta, tell people about Jin, tell people about this wonderful podcast, buy my book when it comes out. Do you have a book coming out? I do. I'm writing my Life After Sugar book. Oh, wow. Do you have a, a date for it? um 2023 how vague awesome. can you be <laughs> it's uh it's a time everybody's yeah. got to have a deadline right yes so i wish you much success and again thank you to the audience for tuning in we'll see you on the next episode bye-bye thank you